Good evening, everybody. It's Maxine coming from Unlocking the Fearless You. Now, today we've got an extra special guest because this guest here is probably the most humblest person I've ever met in my life. He's one of the nicest people I've ever met in my life. And do you know what? He's like a bit of a secret squirrel because when you actually talk to him, not only is he absolutely amazing and he's really kind hearted and he's really lovely, is he just goes, yeah, well, I'm just a vast expert. And that's all he ever says. Right. And I've known this, this gentleman for probably the last nearly three months. So we've been talking probably the last five or six months and I've never really found out some information about him. So I asked him to send some information over. So obviously I can do the interview with him this evening. And I got this I got this information come through and it was just about him and maths. I thought, no, there, there's deeper in this. There's more in this than what he's putting on there. So I gave him a call a couple of hours ago and wow. Right, this gentleman here is going to blow your socks off. And he's going to say to you, oh, he's going to be nothing because of the kind of guy he is. But he is the Mr. Amazing, absolutely brilliant. Here he comes. You ready for this, guys? Mr. Philip Chan. Well, good evening, Maxine. And uh, thank you very much for having me on, on, on your show in the interview. So I'll say uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're listening, maybe uh, here in the UK or in the world. So, um Thank you very much for, for having me on your show. That's absolutely fine. It's, it's absolutely amazing for you to be here because, you know, it, and as I was just saying to everybody, it's very much that you are such a humble person. You just, you know, you put everybody else in the limelight. You stand back. You just go to people. This person's amazing. This person's amazing. And you literally just try and put yourself in the shadows. And I just, like, got your information today, and it was just like, it blew my socks off. So I thought it'd be absolutely amazing to share it with the people out here today. And and I just know that as soon as I talk about it, he's going to go, no, that's all right, that's fine, because that's the kind of person you are. But, you know, I want to go through some things with you. So welcome to Inspire to Achieve Global TV. And Philip Chan, now, I know, obviously, you always say that you should be very tired, you, you shouldn't be in the limelight no more, you shouldn't be doing anything you know, and you're you're at this age and this age, and I can't believe that. I mean, you don't look a day over fifty. Well, thank you, thank you. You know, it, it's it's it absolutely astounds me that you've actually been teaching for fifty years as it is, and I was like, really? But yeah, it's really surprised me. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through a bit about your life. If it excuse me, eyes always seem to water when I get on you. Um, so it's very much that we're going to go through a little bit of your life. Let everybody else know exactly what you're all about and actually blow them socks off like you blew mine off. So I want to say hello to everybody that's coming today. So, so far, we've got Adam in, um, who's coming up from up north. We've also got Harry. Harry, tell you, comment on the on the, uh, on the the post. Tell us where you are, where you're calling in from. Uh, we've also got Susan. She's coming from Oregon in the USA. And we've also got Inspired to Achieve Global TV. Again, come and tell me who you are. So, Philip, let's go through a little bit about your early years because... I know when we spoke earlier on, it was very much that you was behind in a lot of your classes um, growing up. And it was very much that, you know, perhaps you, I don't know what your child was, was like at home. I mean, was it just you and your parents or did you have siblings? Uh, I, also, I moved from Hong Kong to, uh, to the UK. At that time, I had uh, my sister, but there's a big age gap between me and my sister. And because my parents weren't out to work very early in the morning, literally as I get up, I can just see them walking out the door. And as I'm about to go to bed, they're coming in. So I actually spent very little time uh, with my parents. Not, not because of the thought, it's just the nature of, of work. Uh, when I first came over, my grandmother came over from Australia for six months just to look after me because, you know, I was a very young child. Um, the thing is, I didn't speak a word of English and I had to find a way to teach myself how to actually speak English. Now... For my first day of school, and what I my parents forgot to tell me is they added the name Philip to my name because they thought the Chinese name is too difficult for people to hear to to to, uh, to, um, to say it. So, but they just for, happened to forgot to tell me about it. <laughs> so tell everybody your Chinese name. It's Chan Sil Fu, not not a silly fool, Sil Fu. So it's Chan, Chan Sil, Sil Fu. Chan yeah. Sil Fu. Sil Fu. No, not silly fool. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you're a silly fool at all. <laughs> and, and, and so, you know, uh, you know, it's bad enough, you know, not knowing the language. And because if you ever listen to a foreign language, it's just noise. So by process of elimination, if, uh, yeah, afterward, they discovered the only person who didn't answer the name was me. 
and I actually discover I've got this name Philip, which I can't even pronounce at that time, and and all I can remember is the that, that but my name is that. <coughs> that that's that sounds that sound to me the Philip that, that that's that's the, that how it sounds to me. So so I had this name that. <laughs> yeah, so and um so that was embarrassing enough, you know, so that was not a very good start to my school in here. But eventually I've um said, look, this is no good. You know, I I got to find it's not my teacher's fault because they can't speak Chinese. Although, as a child, I actually blamed them at first, but eventually I said, no, actually, no, it's not their their problem. It's my problem. I got to find a way to actually teach myself. So my child logics at that time say, if I see someone speaking, saying something, they're smiling, it must be a good word. So I try to pick up on one word, and then I was trying to impress people by saying this particular word, you know, which I actually got no idea what it meant anyway. And there's so many times I thought I'd be kind to people, and people start looking at me and want to hit me one. I thought, uh-oh, I might have said something bad without knowing it. You know, I said, no, this is not a good strategy. I can get killed by this. And eventually I pick out a set of comics. The first set of comics is actually Batman. Now, if you ever ha uh, seen the Batman comic, he's got these uh, words like biff, buff, buff. I thought it meant something, but, it, it, you know, it's just sound. I'm sure for the first six months, people thought I was this nutter, going, go, how I biff, buff you, you know, that, that you know. So I'm, I'm sure people, yeah. But eventually, somehow, I don't know how, I'll pick out a few words, a few words, then I set myself a daily goal of learning three words a day, three new words a day, three new words a day, and that obviously grown exponentially very, very quickly over time. Uh, so the th and it was horrendous. My first and also in um, as I said, all the way uh, in school to age fourteen, I was actually bottom in every single subject. And if anyone has actually uh, have done that, haven't done well in academics, you know is it's not a nice feeling when other of your schoolmates are doing well and, you know, look, when a teacher gives a piece of homework, some of my friends take maybe uh, 20 minutes or half hour to do the, the piece of work. I used to take three, four hours to do the same thing and still get it wrong, you know, and that becomes very disheartening. And then I then start doing the research and over time, you know, I got better. So how old was it when you, when you come over to the UK from Hong Kong? That was was uh, ten years old. You was ten, right? Okay, so you know, and it, it took you a few years just to learn. So it, you came over quite late then, didn't you? Because it's normally around about I think it's about like ages three to five that your brain's more like a sponge. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. yeah. So I'm, I missed the critical years in terms of learning things uh, picking up very naturally, you know. So I got this image, and also at that time I was extremely. Oh, I'm not tall now. You know, but obviously I was, I was a lot smaller and I was really, I was skinny like bean pole. In fact, if you sneeze, I will, you can actually knock me down, you know. <laughs> um, and, and so be, be, between the um, academic, very poor, and also, you know, it's, uh, physically very weak. And, you know, I started actually developing my own training program to get myself pump, pump up, you know. Wow. Um, and uh, the turning point was actually before the summer of um, of age 14. I made a decision. First of all, I said, if I don't improve academically, I'm not going to get a job. I'm going to get no qualifications. I can get... A... So I decided mentally to give up every one of my holidays. I'm just going to go there, learn. Uh, obviously, we don't have internet in those days. I just go out to library, journal, anything I get hold of. And then I actually uh, did a... a work out a program for myself to to get fit and, and so on and it really the turning point was the the summer you know of when i was age 14. fabulous so so for a question for you i mean can you speak chinese now or is it you just kept to the english language and that was it i can speak chinese but but not very well because you know uh for the first probably 20 something years of, of my life in the uk I very rarely see another Chinese person, you know. Okay. In the, yeah, and it's amazing. There's lots of Chinese people about now, but when I first came, I'd be lucky to see more than two or three Chinese people in the whole year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, yeah. And then my parents said, said um, they do not want me to to do anything Chinese until I learned the language. So by the time I actually start learning the, the language, I've forgotten how to write. So I got I can't write or read Chinese now because I just got out of habit. 
Right. Yes, I do speak Chinese, but but in a couple of times, the few times I go to Chinese takeaway, and the the, the people on the counter say, "You speak a bit funny." It's almost like imagine a a, a Chinese person is a, a Chinese person speaking English with a funny Chinese accent. I am the other way around. I'm I'm, I'm the, the yeah the um the Anglo Chinese, Chinese, speaking Chinese English. yeah, yeah. Speaking, <laughs> speaking a funny like Chinese. You know, so my accent actually is is my Chinese accent is quite weird, according to some of the other Chinese people. You know, <laughs> uh, but at the same time, I'm very conscious. I still have an accent, so I'm still working on my English every day because yeah. the you know to get rid of the the, the uh, accent because I'm yeah. still the accent it still isn't anywhere near perfect my English at the moment. So I'm still working on it every day. And, and you've been here many, many years now, and you're still working on it. But you know I'm what? Sorry. I can understand you, and I think everybody else can understand you. No, just sorry, go yes. over that way, just slightly, uh, this this way, just so I can uh, get you in the, in the as if as it perfect. <laughs> we sort of we sort of disappear in you as you're going round. <laughs> <laughs> so it's very much so. You won from the ages of zero to ten. You was in Hong Kong. All you spoke was Chinese, didn't even know a word of English. Now you've been over in the UK for many, many years. Yeah. And now you don't hardly speak a lot of, of uh, Chinese at all. It's very much mainly English that you use. Yes. And, I mean, how did you find that over the three years that it took you, or three or four years that it took you to learn that? I mean, the English language is a hard language to learn. Did you pick it up pretty easily? Because you're saying you was learning like three words, you know, well, a day. The, no, the, 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 the first year was amazingly difficult. I, I literally want to jump off the bridge every day, you know. Uh, but after that, then after about a year and a half, then it, it started to pick up exponentially. Uh, yeah, but the first year and a half, I, I yeah. And also the, uh, the, the first year and a half getting used to the English food, I used to be sick every day. I'm, I'm used to it now. I love it now. I love it now. You know, but but yeah, it took a whole year and a half to actually get used to the food as well. But I'm, I'm now that I, I don't even think about it now. Brilliant, brilliant. So it's very much. So what changed at you at the age of fourteen? Well, I, I think as, first of all, I was sick in the time being being dumb. And you see, also in the Chinese, then if you are not very good academically, it is a disgrace to. Uh, yeah, to, to your parents and the family. So there was a, there's, there's a shame in that. Also, physically, I was very, very small. And obviously, you know, um, there was potential for bullying. You know, there was a little bit of bullying to, to begin with, but somehow I managed to uh, um, sidetrack that. It, 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 interesting enough, two of the people who bullied me the most when uh, early in my school, they become actually two of my best friends. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not turning negative into a positive yeah so so uh and in fact it's uh, and then after a while they they uh, anyone tried bullying me they they become my staunch uh, <laughs> uh champion to go don't don't you do don't you do that <laughs> they become your bodyguards <laughs> yeah, they become my bodyguard yeah, yeah. So, so it's it's quite amazing how things has turned mm -hmm. turned around uh looking back for you know how how did it happen yeah it seems a miracle yeah, brilliant. Well, we've got also got Zara that's, that's came in and uh, she's tuned in as well. Hello, Zara. Nice to nice, nice to see you here. Um, we've got a few people that have tuned in. Literally, ask your questions. Is there anything for Philip that you'd like to know? Ask him a question. It might be a master question. You never know. It might just be a question about him. Um, we're quite happy and open to you know to to any questions that come in. Um, right. So let's go on to your. Let's go a little bit further. Let's go on to your past professions because I nearly fell off my chair. When you told me about your past professions, because it was very much that, you know, oh, I didn't really do much. But for what I've got here, I'll, I'll read out the list that I've got of some of them that you've, you've told me, and then we'll go through a few of them. Now, you certainly said, said uh, once a week you went to uh, Radio Oxford and you was doing the commentating for sports. You was also a sports commentator for Sports for All. And you said, was it three years you said you did that for? Yeah. You were also a photography assistant and we used developing films for a year. You was a will writer. You were an environmental scientist for two years and a financial planner at American Express. Yes. And that's only the things, guys, that I've dug deep in. I actually got this information out of him because this gentleman is like a secret squirrel. So for the things that you've done, so let's start from the top. So you, you worked in radio. What got you into radio from you going from... Um, from not really working very well at school to learning everything that you possibly can. Yeah. 
why did you decide to go into radio and why sports? Well, I, actually, I didn't actually decide to go into radio because then, uh, as I said, I was physically very uh, weak and then uh, I pumped up and then I start, well, start winning things at, at sports and uh, in, in different sports. Like, um, I became counter champion in, in uh, Middlesex with badminton and things like this. Um, I was, then I started doing running. I got, you know, uh, the county and nationals and, and other sports as, as well. And then obviously, then uh, people heard about me. And uh, and also at that time, once you're involved in sport, you tend to uh, delve in all sorts of different sports. And um, because at that time, I, I just wasn't good at anything. I just want to try different things out. So I, and I discovered I actually then, um, over a couple of years, I started to pick up different sports very, very quickly. And I got reasonable at, at it. And then obviously uh, someone heard about me and then they said, uh, well, you'd like to come in uh, every Saturday for, uh, there's a 40 minute, five minute show. Uh, they have a couple of guests on and then for a start about 10, 15 minutes, people were phoning, asking different questions about sports, about training methods and, and different things. And I just share my, uh, my knowledge, expertise, you know, how I went from this person to that and how I won this and that, that stuff, you know. And that was it, really. Fantastic. We've got Lee here. He's Lee, Lee Parsons is coming. He's uh, he's walking the dog at the moment, so it'll be a bit breezy <laughs> in there, but you're going to get loads of information there, Lee. Um, Zara's came in, and she says, I hope you're good. Um, we've got Susan that said, hello. And then we've got Inspired to Achieve. Guys, it's all about commenting, liking, and sharing as much as you possibly can. If you want to start a watch party, then start a watch party. Let's get it out there as much as we possibly can. At the end of the day, Philip Chan is the man. He's the connector, that I, the best connector I've ever met. Do you know what? Let's connect him. It's our time today to connect him to all these people around the world and connect him like he's never been connected before. So it's our time. So let's do this. I want to say hi to Adam. Thank you very much for coming in as well. So, yeah, I mean, let's, let's carry on talking about um, some of your past uh, professions. So, you know, you did the radio. You was also a sport, sports commentator, which is obviously the reasons why you got into so many sports and people were asking you. Is What made you get into photography? It was my uncle. Right. My uncle, Jeffrey. He um, he couldn't pay someone, so he has been a nephew. He, he thought it's a cheat. And, and he, he, he sold, sold it to me as, you know, you need some work experience. So therefore, I got dragged around with him. In the, in those days, see, he goes around to do all these different nightclubs and taking photos, and then uh, and and people say how much it is, and he said, well, well, then they'll he'll take the money, then we will go back develop the films, and then send it to the people. So it was um I didn't get paid for it, but it's a good experience. So uh, thank you, Uncle Jeffrey. That was uh, interesting. You go around different nightclubs and uh, you know carrying the stuff around, get the film, then go in the dark room in the the old fashioned one where you and roll the film in the dark, you put the chemicals yeah. in, then you hang them up to dry and wash them. And yeah, the, the young people haven't got a clue what we're talking about. Yeah. But in, in the, those days, it, it took a long time, yeah. you know, and you've got to go into this dark room or a red light to develop the film. Yeah, yeah. so I've done about a year, yeah. year, year or so of that. Yeah, well, I, I did photography at college and I did exactly that. I mean, you know, when we're talking in a dark room, I know when you when you see on TV, you see the red lights. But, yeah, you do use the red light, but that is to, to do in your photos. But when you actually develop a film, I mean, I used to do black and white film. But when you develop a, a film, it's very much you can do this. And I mean, literally this. Mm. And you cannot see in front of you. It is as black as black can be. And it is literally what you're doing is you're feeling the actual mm. film. You take the end off. You yes. unreel it. You find the ends because obviously it's got little notches in it, hasn't it? Yeah, you yes. put it in and then you do this with it. Yeah, and then you can the wheel. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Put so you do that. Put the chemicals in and you. That's it. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Put the chemicals in. And obviously, you've got to see where the pot is and everything else, which yes. obviously you're doing everything by touch. You put it in the pot, you put like one, two, three, or four films in, and you give it a bit of, you know, agitate it, as they say. Um, and then obviously leave it on the side for a certain amount of time. I can't remember what it is now. It's probably about an hour, I think it was. I can't remember. Yeah, there's a timer on. Then, then, yeah, yeah, on yeah, time yeah. Time. I remember that. I remember the timer. And then literally what you do is you then tip all the chemicals out and then you wash it all out. Once you do that, then that's when you put it up on the dryer. Yes. Once you put it up on the dryer and you dry your films out, you can then use your films, put it in the, uh, I can't remember what that's called either, the um, the yeah. projector. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't remember what it's called now. It's been so long ago. And then obviously you do your pictures, but obviously all the all the paper that you have, you cannot also get that in the light because as soon as you put light on it, it goes black. 
Yes. And it's exactly the same as film. So it's very much photography paper. You you do it in the dark, but you've got either a, a yellow light or a red light. Yes. And yes. you put it under, put the film on, put it on for a couple of seconds, and then you put it in three different solutions. Now, when I used to do that, I, I mean, it used to smell so badly. <laughs> and even you talking about it now just from, takes me back to college. Is that It's like a vinegary kind of eggy kind of smell. Yes. And I, I remember coming home and my hands used to stink. <laughs> Yeah, it, it does take me back a you know a long while, and and I remember doing so many of those back at college, yeah. and I mean when I when I went to college in 1998, you know digital cameras were just coming in, mm. so that makes me feel really old. Um, yeah, so it was very much that, you know, it, it was we did lots and lots of film, and and I do miss those days, and I do it does take me back because I still got the pictures, and I imagine yeah. that. You know the experience that you went through. I mean, why did you not not carry the photography on at all? Did you not want to go that far with it, or was no, that I got bored with it because you know this, the, the flashlight we got on cameras now. We used to have these light bulbs. You got to put in it individually. Once you've done it, you got to replace another one. Oh, you know, okay. uh, and I got, just got bored with it. And also the fact that going to around a different night club. So I'm not. I'm. I. I hate smoking, and you get so much smoke uh, in those places. It actually made me sick. You know. So I, and I thought, oh, no, this is not the life for me, you know. Although it was good money. It was good money in those days. And it's just amazing that, you know, pe uh, people say, how, how much do you, you charge? You? They would hand over money to you and you just uh, take down the, the phone number and address. And they trust you. It's amazing, you know. Yeah. Uh, but in, but then in those days where very people are trustworthy and people are honourable, they, they're not going to take your money and run. Mm. So it's a, it was an interesting experience. Yeah. Exactly. And then and then I know obviously you did a will writing and you did a financial planning and for American Express and that. And obviously so you you you've got all your math stuff in there and you've well, got I your got writing my, and I got qualified with a charter insurance uh, insurance and I got my all my certificates for will uh, pensions and the financial planning. Um, and also I do lots of inheritance tax planning at, at that time because I could actually read through things very quickly and spot the, the gaps because every time they come and change the the budget, they always do it so quickly, and there's gaps in in the the legislations, especially the financials. And if you know what you're looking for, you can use those to your client's advantage. Yeah. You know, uh, and le legally, the honest legally, without yeah. Uh, and there's so much gap. And I was actually one of these people who can quickly read through the uh, yeah, a watch of legislation, big, and I can see the gaps very quickly. Brilliant. Okay. So, and then you went into environmental science. Yes, I mean, I, how comes I, that was a massive change? I mean, I, I did I did sciences a few years ago in 2014, and I did biology, physics, chemistry, and forensics. So I'm quite interested in sciences. But after all the will writing, after doing the planning, after doing the maths, after doing everything in sports, and then also the will writing came, came later. Yeah, the will came later, but it doesn't. Matter. But huh? you see, I uh, live near the Heathrow Airport, and obviously, you know, anyone who lived near the Heathrow Airport, you know, the the, the sound, the noise, you know. And the, the time, if you actually, the rest of the Heathrow, sometimes when a plane goes goes uh, over, you can't actually hear what the person's saying. But you learn to lip read, you know, say, you know. And I was very interested in, you know, you know the, there's noise pollution and also even back then the debate of, you know, expanding the, the airport. So I spent two years uh, going around to, to get the data for the noise and, and also uh, the roads around the area. And I've actually developed a system to how to use the noise to uh, turn into electricity and also to run when people uh, repair the road, you know, they've got to dig it all up and then it causes a lot of traffic problems and so on. And I had the idea actually um, to redesign the road like uh, blocks of, like Lego, blocks of, you know, so if a section of the road, you just lift the section out then replace it with a, a, a different section. But within that system, there are three systems. There's the vibration system that would then use a sort of thing to use the vibration to turn the electricity. Uh, there was the, uh, when it's raining, to use the, the hydraulic system to actually turn that into electricity. And there was another thing. Um, but when I actually put that to the Oxford University, they actually proved that so that's just, those systems will work. But given the material and uh, the know-how, then it would cost something like eight million pounds to actually do one stretch of road, compared oh, wow. to the compared to the normal system, it would cost two million. Now, eventually, that will pay for itself, but uh, yeah. uh, but there's too much of risk at, at, at the time. So that that was then um, um, shelf, and I lost interest. So in fact, I've actually thrown the the, the research away, 
you know, because, um, you know, but I, lost I, was, <laughs> I, I lost interest, but, but I'm sure if with today's technology, maybe, you know, uh, what would cost eight million then, that could possibly come down to maybe half a million or, or even, you know, about a million, million pounds. Perhaps you should have kept that and used it now. Yeah, but I, again, because I've lost interest, then, uh, you know, I'm, it just, it's, I can't even remember where I was reading uh, some of my notes about four or five years ago. I couldn't even understand what I've written. Oh, really? <laughs> so, so yeah, it's all Chinese to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you are funny. <laughs> All uh, right, okay. So we'll go to the next one with uh, Philip being comical as usual. And um, so then you became a teacher. Now, Philip's been a teacher. He's done maths, PE, geography, and you've been a teacher for about 45, 50 years, isn't it? Yeah, I've obviously uh, full time for full 45 years and then obviously a little bit part time. So probably around about 50 year ish, give or take, I don't know, half a decade. <laughs> 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 so you've done that quite a lot I mean is it you know when you did teaching what did you prefer because I know when we spoke you said that you taught everybody from from very young children to people in junior and, and um, senior school right up to you know college and adults you've taught yeah. everybody yeah. yeah so what would you say that you prefer to teach personally I would say now given my age I, I want to focus on the younger ones because getting the foundation right then that will be a, a great platform and springboard for, for the future life and for the confidence. You see, there's, I've discovered over time, there's so many people who feel they're underachieving, but it's, it's nothing to do with ability, it's about confidence. Yeah. And I am so um, concerned, especially in the last 20 years, in, in terms of UK education, the system actually has to actually really actually knock people's confidence down. And so many people come out with very low qualification. In fact, they're brilliant. But, you know, when I do my workshops, uh, the people say, I can't do maths. But, but within a, literally uh, two or five minutes, they discover, you know, they can actually do it and they do it very, very quickly. Normally, I say to people, when they, you come to my maths workshop, you can never, because I'm the 10-second maths expert, you can never be as good as me. But, but once I share with you what I know and you practice that, then you, you can be better than me then that is the thing. I don't want any of my students to, you know, to be uh, equal or equal than me. I want them to be better. And in so many, so many cases over the years, in the different schools I taught, some of my ex-pupils now, I think a few are touching 60 or could be just uh, gone over 60 now. They have, wow. they have actually done so much better than, than me. You know, uh, in yeah. fact, one of my ex-pupils contacted me literally about three, uh, two weeks before Christmas we lost contact, and he actually I got a double first from Oxford, you know, on on mass uh, as well. Wow. So I got so many ex people who now got PhD, uh, masters, and yeah. So that yeah, is so the thing that 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 really excited me, you know, that my students, my former students, are actually better than me. So you're getting all your people that you've taught in one room, and then telling you all the things they have done, and you just stood there. How would that make you feel? Well, be brilliant because I also since the launch of Facebook, I'm, I'm actually connecting with former pupils almost every month, you know, and these could be 20, 30, 40 years back, you know, and then they're telling me this and that. I got a couple of uh, former students who were actually it was in the bottom of of, uh, of school, and they've now uh, one person, uh, Sarah, I don't know what's your, your married name, and she actually failed her exam, but then she went. Um, she had three kids, and she wanted to prove to her kids that that you know she can actually do things. And uh, she went to college, and she got her maths uh, GCSE, and she actually got her maths degree as as well, you know. Wow. And yet she was the bottom. So it means that we can all change. You yeah. see, we we've been told lots of lies. You see, when you get that certificate of whatever subject you achieve, whatever grade, that is only true in that moment of time. That does not define you for the rest of your, your life. But we've got this notion that if I achieve a grade at a G, for instance, that, that I will always have a, be a grade G. That's not true. You know, with life with different experience, you know, if you then do the same exam again uh, a few years down the road, that G can be a, a C or B or even A, and or a, 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 a star. 
you know, yeah. or the, or the, or the, the new top grades, which is a grade one now in, in, in the new um, exam mm. system. Yeah, and I completely agree with you, and I, and I can prove that. And the reason why I can prove that is because when I was at, at, at school, I wasn't really into school. I didn't really like school. I was the class clown. I was a joker. I just wanted to muck around. I just wasn't interested because I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I knew I liked maths and I knew I liked science, but I was in such a low set because I just wasn't interested in it because the teacher, I just didn't get on with the teacher. And it was very much that when I left college, when I left school, I actually got a double E in science. And I got a D and an E in English and I got a D, uh, no, an E in maths. And I was like, you know, I, I left school and I didn't do too well because I just I just wasn't bothered. And everything that I learned, I learned on the job. And that's something that I did. So when in 2014, after obviously the, the problems with my back, I decided to go back to college and, and a friend of mine said, well, what do you want to do? I said, well, actually, I'd love to go back and do science. But I know I wanted to do forensics because mm. it's something that was always interested in me. So when I actually looked at a, um, a, a course that actually did forensics, it was applied science, which did um, level two diploma in chemistry, physics, biology and also forensics. So I was like, well, do you know what? I'll give it a go. And it was hard work. And I mean, literally, we're talking 46 assignments in six months. You know, these assignments are anything from like four pages to 40. Mm. And it, they were absolutely huge. Um, and I also took functional skills level two, maths and English, because I knew that I was actually pretty good at maths. But because I was so bad in my English because of my dyslexia, they brought me down to the next paper. But I'd learned the higher paper, but they wouldn't let me take it because my English wasn't good enough. So it was very much that I got disheartened over it. So, you know, when I when I went to, to college, I actually come top of my class in maths. I come top of my class in English and got four distinction stars through the whole year. So exactly what you're saying there is like, no matter how bad you are when you was at school, if you actually put the action in, if you actually do the work and actually, you know, go in there and set your mind to say it's something that you want to do, you can come out top of everything. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. When you're saying that, I, I, I had a flashback to, to my school day. And in fact, I've never got to set one for mass. I got to set two. And in fact, in those days, uh, you also like you have a mock exam yeah. for the teacher to decide what. For the, in those days, if you actually in the, the school I was in, if you didn't pass your math exam, then the school don't pay for your exam. Your parents have to pay for you. Oh wow! And I failed my mock exam by I think one mark. Yeah. And I was dreading. I thought, oh no, I got to tell my mum and dad I fell, and they got to pay for it. They got to yeah. make make mince me out of my bottom. You know. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I, <laughs> Uh, yeah. Have you seen those those Chinese dumplings with, with the meat in? Yeah, that that, that that's that's the, the the raw meat they use. Uh, the Chinese boys who failed the failed the math exam. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, no, no, and uh, and I was dreading, and I, I pleaded with uh, my the, the, the teacher in charge, and he said, basically, so well, tough luck. You didn't work hard enough, so tough luck. Yeah. Go home, and I plead, and, and um. Mr. Duff, who's the one teacher who actually, um, yeah, heard it, and I was, and and he said, you know, are you really serious about this? And I said, yes, sir, yes, I am, I am really seriously. And because of Mr. Duff, Roland Duff, uh, you know, because of that one man, thank you, I, I've been trying to trace him now for over fifty odd years. I found three of my mass, mass, uh, sorry, of the three math teachers who my inspiring, who I actually dedicate this book to. Yeah. I don't care if it doesn't sell a single copy, or, or they actually, actually did this sell a few, but this was for them. I managed to trace one of my my teacher, but Mr. Duff was the key man, and he said two things that actually changed my life, really. He said, um, if you honestly don't understand something, there's no such thing as a stupid question. That's right. But the second thing that really kind of uh, resonated and really blew my mind, he said, is, and he said, it's better for you to feel dumb for five minutes than stay dumb for the rest of your life. And and that got me start asking questions. I wouldn't ask any questions because I thought if I ask questions, people will think I'm stupid and so on. And from that point, I start asking, bugging people to death. Yeah. And interestingly, within in the two t school terms, I start to transform by asking lots of questions, asking for help. And, and then I went from set 10 to set 2 in most subjects, you know, and also, when I actually uh, passed my the old old days, not GCSE but the O level, yeah. Um, 
I, I, I went for my A level maths, and at that time, at school, if you're not in set one, you are definitely not allowed to do A level full stop. And again, I pleaded with, with uh, my teachers that said, no, no, sorry. And Mr. Duff was on my side, and eventually, with his help, I actually then uh, did the, the A-level a- a- masses as well. So uh, mm. if that didn't happen, the rest of the thing had become a 10-second mass expert would never, ever happen. So sometimes, so like, Mr. Duff, eh? sometimes you need one person believe you. Interesting, of the three mass teachers, technically, Mr. Duff was the worst, mathematically. <laughs> but he was, but he was the most inspiring teacher, and because it doesn't matter how much time I goof up, messed up, and he just said, "Okay, no problem, have, have another go," you know, and that was his attitude. Yeah, okay, you yeah. know, rather than uh, sometimes other things that say, you know, you stupid so and so, boom, yeah, and he was just so encouraging, and I have never ever forgotten that. Uh, although, having said, if I do mention uh, track Mr. Mr. Rowan Duff down, he would be probably about hundred. 10, 15 years old now. So, so, um, but I, but if, so if you're not around, I, I hope I can try some down your family, at least then to give this book to say thank you from, from me, yeah. you know, uh, but I'm, I'm not going to stop uh, trying to track down his, his family. So, again, sometimes you just need one encouraging person who says something to you and that will change, you know, it certainly changed my life. Mm-hmm. And as I said, if he didn't do that, I, the, 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 these other books I've written would never would have ha- happened, and I would have never become the ten second mass expert of of today. So uh, that one kindness of, of the uh, encouraging teacher have actually changed my life. So, sir, thank you very much wherever you are. So we've now got to share this out, everybody, to make sure that Philip Chan can get the the grandchildren or your children of Mister, or probably grandchildren, R- Roland of, Duff. Yeah, of Mister Duff. Um, yep, yeah, who was a maths teacher, yeah. and yep, yeah, we've got to try and check him, track him down now. I mean, anything's possible now on Facebook. Yes, you yes. Never know. So let's go on to a little bit more now. So we'll come back to your teaching days in in a few moments. Um, so after that, you, you became a geologist for forty years. <laughs> where, where did that one come from? Well, that, that, that's why you can see this stone face. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, Don't stonewall, just get on with it. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, no, I, I, I tried to play the guitar, it didn't, didn't, didn't work. So, so, so people say you got to rock on. So, so then, uh, then I become a, a, a geologist. Okay, because I was trying different things out. Because I, I, I wasn't good at anything. So I was trying different things out. So yeah. and, uh, I did that for a couple of years. I learned a little bit. I didn't do too well, but I, at least I learned a bit of experience and used to go out to different places to. Uh, cold, wet place, draw, do the diagram, take measurements. You know, it, it was an uh, interesting experience. It's tough for my character. I don't think I cheat very much by that, but uh, in, in terms of actual anything concrete, but except it, it built up an inner character to go out in the cold, wet rain, uh, walk miles to take uh, da- data and measurements, then come back to uh, do drawings and so on. So, yeah, it's, it's, uh, and it's sort of developed other parts of my, my brain. So did you mix your geology in with when you was doing, obviously you was a teacher with your geography? With the geography, yeah, that, the geography and the maths. And, and yeah, the PA, oh, okay. And the PE as well. Oh, okay, okay. So one question I want to ask you that probably a lot of people would love to ask is that if you could change one thing in the education system, what would it be? Easy. Get rid of the, get rid of the education minister so it's non-political. Because the, the problem with the UK system is every time they change a the government, there's, there's a new education minister. Even within the, the period of the government, there's sometimes two or three different changes of that, that position. Now, human nature is such that when a new minister comes into the office, whether he is a he or she, they want to make their mark. So sometimes they will change things just for the sake of changing it rather than leave things alone when it doesn't need to be fixed. In fact, interest in the UK system, every uh, education minister, apart from one, Estelle Morris, she was the only person who's ever had any experience in education. So you've got people in charge of the education who have no experience what the education is about. So they're using a baby logic of to put a scheme in without understanding how the brain actually works. Mm-hmm. You see, well, if you look at the training teachers, they're, they're trained to plan the lesson sequentially 
you know, step one, two, three, four, five, six, and, and so on. And 70 to 80 percent of the, the teachers do it that way. But over 70 or 80 percent of the, the pupils, or we, don't learn like that to be, learn effective learning. We don't do very well. Step one, two, three, four, that that mm. way. That doesn't work for everyone. So one system that you know does not fix all. And yeah. now with the the system since uh, in introduced by Sir Keith Joseph uh, during uh, Mr. Thatcher reign is having this unified system, which is great in theory, but then become become uh, a conveyor belt. So therefore, you know, everyone must learn it the same way. Well, the, the nature is we don't because we all got different learning styles. Some people are very uh, visual. Some people like to talk through. Some people are very hands-on. But that is not catered for, you know. Mm -hmm. And also when I look at the train of the teachers, I'm appalled uh, by it because um, the system on paper looks great, but it's not very practical. And in fact, lots of the, the the training people in the university who train teachers, they haven't been in the classroom for over 20, 30, 40 years. You know? Yeah. Uh, and also the, the system that the learning is geared back to the industrial age, which is not applicable for the modern age with the new technology. So people are not taught how to think, you know? And that's the biggest problem. You know, you have this very uh, conveyor belt uh, type type of uh, learning that's not very conducive. So the one biggest change I want, well, is is actually not to have an education minister, to but I have someone in charge that will stay for years and not just for you know uh, a couple of months or one or two years. Then it, it's change again. And so should we just put you in charge? <laughs> To give you a new job, you know, we might just give you something a little bit extra to do because you know all these things that you do already. You know, one more is a, you know. <laughs> well, interesting when uh, Esther Morris, when she resigned, and she said uh, she didn't have enough ex education experience to do be able to do that job properly, hmm. and you thought, wow, this is the the person who felt who had the experience yeah. in education didn't feel she had enough experience to actually be able to do that job properly mm. and that was the reason why she resigned for an honorary offer you know she rather just hang on to office for say to, to get the money you know i my hat off to her you, you know she actually did it for the right reason yeah and the thing is it's like you know i'm very much i'm a visual person but then i have to be shown and i do it so i'm, I'm a visual and a doer and that, that's how I learn. And it's something that I've always done. I learn through pictures, through art and things like that. And there was one picture that I did see. And it was a picture of a monkey, an elephant, a fish and a bird and a human being. And this particular person came up to him and said, in the education system, you're all going to learn one way. I want you all to swim in the lake <laughs> underneath the water. And it's exactly that. That is the education system. Yes, yes, it, is, yes. it is literally one way. But how can a monkey swim underwater and not breathe? How can a bird swim underwater and not breathe? And, you know, and you've got an elephant that can do it on the odd occasion and a fish that's like, yep, I'm absolutely happy. And this is the thing. It's exactly what you were saying about the education system. It is one way of doing things that is completely outdated compared to everything else. I mean, cars that we've had have, have gone from, you know, working where you, you, you've got to turn the turn it to actually get it started right through to obviously electric cars and you've got your diesel and, and stuff like that right through from you know doing other things like technology that's gone from you know the the wireless i remember like the dial up right up to the things that you get now a computer is literally in your hand yes and the education system has never ever changed yes you know? it's like you know most of the, the telephone you used to have the telephone box you put your money into the ring call yeah. everyone's got mobile now you know yeah. you got the um, pips and pips, yeah. people remember the pips <laughs> yeah you got 10 seconds left beep, 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 beep. yeah so things have changed so much but but you know we the the teachers are not trained you know and also the paradox is look at university you know like it's in the, the business professors in, in this country 90 something uh, percent of them have never run a business and yeah. yet they're actually teaching people how to run business when they have no experience you know uh, i would say even the bigger portion in schools of teachers actually are teaching business education they have never have any experience of running their business at all and they're teaching business education yeah <laughs> exactly exactly so let's go on to your next bit because uh, um, obviously we'll go back to obviously your math side a bit afterwards um charities so we'll put this, this category in because you are a massive 
person to come with charities because you do so much and I didn't actually know how much you really do. I remember when at the Christmas party you invited me to the UNICEF ball and you said like you don't want to come along and I was like I was doing something at the time so I couldn't go. However, it was like I didn't realise that you're a children's champion and you was also in the official video and you know when it comes to charity, tell us a little bit about what you do with UNICEF. Uh, UNICEF, I'm a, a children's champion. So what does so that mean in general? The, the children's champions, basically, uh, since the war in Syria and other, other wars in the world, there's caused a loss of uh, refugee uh, children, obviously losing their parents and so on. So there's lots of ref refugees, you know, uh, particularly in, in Syria. So that's why the, you've got uh, children in camps in different parts of Europe. One of the crazy um, laws in the UK is then, if they have lost their parents and they've got, uh, say, a uh, family in this country who wouldn't to take them on, the children are not allowed to apply until they get to Europe. That means that is, so they can make all these dangerous trips to go to a foreign country across the sea and get drowned. So, yeah, so until they get to the shores of Europe, they are not allowed to apply. So as a children's champion, uh, we want to uh, get, make the MPs, lots of MPs don't know this. In fact, the Home Secretary, who's the person that can change the law, you know, that they don't even know this exists. So the children's family to make a way of, of people so that you can write to your MPs to say, hey, this is such an in, injustice, you know. I'm not sure about Rocky Bob, but I That was really good, Robert. I like that. I was like, I had a little giggle to myself. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Because I was a geologist, I tried to get the Rocky roll, but I didn't get it. So, <laughs> no, so, 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 so as a children's chamber, we're trying to uh, make people, the public aware so they can actually write a letter to the MP to pressurise Home Secretary to change a silly clause in, in the law. Then that would save a lot of children's lives, having to go through the, these dangerous uh, different countries and have to come yeah. across the sea and, and so on. Okay. Um, also... I think uh, UNICEF felt sorry for, for me because uh, I've, I've been a member for, I, sh I can't remember, this is started my 56th or 57th year, that this year. And so a few years ago, they came up to, yeah, so they, uh, they came up to Luton, where I, I live about three, four years ago, to do a video. Unfortunately, that, that was the day after I came out from hospital. That, that's why the, on the video I didn't look very good. Um, my, what a lot of people don't understand. Around the world, there's disasters going on. There's something like anything from 250 to 300 disasters happen all the time in, in, in the world. But only one or two uh, get televised. But UNICEF have got this 48-hour policies. and They can actually send a team to almost anywhere in the world, you know, the relief team, within 48 hours. So in order to have that uh, provision, they have to have the funding all year round. So also as a gift and will uh, person to encourage people to leave money in, in their wills. So the, the funding is just all around. And the, the emergency centre is actually in uh, Copenhagen. You know, I really was gutted. I'd missed my opportunity to do the, the visit the centre last year because I wasn't well. You know, and I believe this amazing centre that got things stocked up that can go to different parts of the world within 48 hours, you know. And so they actually uh, very graciously put me on, on the on the official video uh, a couple of years ago. Amazing, absolutely amazing. And not only that, guys, it's it's not just the fact he's a you know he's a children's champion of UNICEF and he's been there for fifty seven years, which is absolutely unbelievable. And then a geologist for forty years, and then a teacher for forty five, for nearly fifty years. That also you would you're also in a second charity, which is at Shelter for the Homeless, and you've been there fifty years. Well, Shelter for Homeless started in 1966, and in fact, um, obviously that's the same year the, the England won the World Cup. Yeah. But there was a lot of homelessness, and in fact, it just coincided with a, a program on TV called Kathy Come Home. Mm -hmm. um, and so I can remember the first office that was in, in Strand, there's one little office, and then within a year, uh, a number of us who were just, well, we, we just got passionate, we didn't care about... Uh, political correctness and so on you know we just just did lots of fundraising different ideas um and to help and so today i'm very proud what what shelter has done they have done an amazing thing in the last 50 years you know um is um i don't look that young it's just actually it, the reason why i still got to work 
after retirement, so I have the daily facelift. That's costing me a fortune now. I think that was Robert on, on, on things saying yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, so hold uh, the hope. Clip, hold on, clip. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so so the the homelessness situation that really touched my heart at, at, at that time, and so I got involved in a lot lots of uh, different uh, fundraising act activities. Um, yeah, that that's so it's been yeah. uh, been a while. Yeah, so it's been a while. So, and also it, it's not just the only thing that he's done. He's also the world's second best for walking, and he also gives that to charity. Tell us a little bit about that one and what that one's about. Um, as I say, I support a lot of charities, and so I do lots of uh, um, they call fun walking. Uh, so I used to do maybe a, a, a weekend doing a back to back walk for one charity, say on a Friday, something at midnight, to do a 50 mile, mile so we can finish on a Saturday. And then uh, sometimes on a Sunday, I've got another charity where I'm actually in one of the organizers as well, but that's only a 20 miler. You know. Oh, only just you should just down the road. So, so then, then, so, so I will do a say, so Friday midnight to so, so Saturday, then do a 50 miler, then also a little bit of rest because obviously, in Saturday afternoon, I've got the sports with football, hockey, and so on. And then, obviously, the, the Sunday, then, um, to do a, a 20 mile for another, another a charity. And occasionally, I'm, I'm one of the organizers as well. So, what I then do is, uh, when people get started on the Sunday one, I do a power walking to get finished quickly, then go right back to the last person, then then bring in the rear. Yeah. So you say you're you're the best time, you're the second best. Is well, that in, in the UK or? Oh, that was in the world. That was in the world. In the world. Well, See, that, this is what I mean by humble. You know, nobody knows all this information. Well, no, He's no, the no. second fastest person in the world for walking. <laughs> well, that, that, I, that's that's back. In the, that's we're talking about millennium ago. You know, it, well, I didn't go for the record. It's just basically uh, someone said, oh, you know, uh, you started then, so you took you X, X number of hours. And then at that time, uh, someone checked it out and said, oh, by the way, did you know uh, that that was the second world best time at that time? So it was the, by default, purely by, the, the, by default. It's not a record I went for deliberately at, at, at all. It just happened by accident. Like I said, very, very humble. So next thing that we, we've got on the agenda is uh, um, the... You're going to need to obviously explain a little bit more to people about this one because you're also a part of this one, which is the CEWC, which is the Council of Education for World Citizenship. Yes, back back in those oops, <laughs> sorry, uh, back in those days, it's, it's part of the UN uh, organization uh, to educate young people uh, in world peace. So, in fact, they, they we used to actually do a lot of conference at the uh, Central Westminster Hall. You need to come back in screen, Philip. Yeah, so, thought yeah. we've gone screen, screen with it. Okay. Right, so we, so we actually have uh, lots of conferences to educate and uh, to get uh, make discussion for young people. So I, know, I was involved in organising that uh, sub area organisation to get people to these these events. Um, but it, it's a very simple role, we just yeah, you know, just encourage different people to come come do share, and we've got different uh, world class speakers sharing their experience about different things to do with peace or um, and just uh, encourage young uh, education young people. Yeah, you know, how they could become a part of the peace process. Uh, it's very much like today, and also the uh, Universal Peace uh, Federation as well, and they they do very much, which also I'm a member of. Just, just wow! Now you've been on many different TV channels, and um, you've been across different programs on Sky TV. You've also been on London Live, and you did it with obviously your maths, but also you did it with UNICEF. I mean, was it just to, to show people exactly what you do? Or is it what the what the charities do? Or it's not it's not about me. It's, it's all about the charity because I'm uh, I, I'm just a supporter. I'm just it's just one of the many supporters. So it's, it's about the charity. It's not about me at all. You're just a messenger, aren't you? I'm just a messenger. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. So Robin put something on here that was actually really funny, but I'm going to put it on here. But it's going to cover your face. But I'll, I'll read it quite quickly to you. When I walk, I walk on a tightrope of reality, walking and walking on the verge of losing my mind. Oh, say, say to me, please say that this can't be. Oh, say, say to me, please say that this can't be. Lyrics from the French-Canadian group, The Box. They are on YouTube, most excellent. Remember to take those moments to relax so that one doesn't kill oneself. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, Robert. <laughs> and a little giggle over that, so I thought I'd, I'll have to put it up, even though obviously it covered us up completely. Yes, that, that, that reminds me sometimes when people ask me what do I do, uh, rather than give them a, a straight answer, I, I normally say this way, I 
I teach people to do what they don't do. Yeah. So when you do do what you don't do, then I don't. <laughs> but do you? <laughs> right, let's go on to the next section. So we've now got public speaking. Now, I didn't realise that you've been a public speaker for 35 years and you go into women's institutes and you also do UNICEF. So tell us a little bit about your public speaking. Well, again, I think that that was uh, my default because I was a, a UNICEF supporter and I was looking at different ways to, to raise money for them on a consistent basis. And because I've done different things, uh, so I have a list of topics that people can, can call, call me to speak on. It could be on the memory, on, uh, on education, on, on money finance for, for women, uh, will, will writing and relaxation and um, doing facials. I've actually... For my sins, there was a time I did qualify doing professional facials. And so I would then get invited by the different members of the uh, WI Women's Institute because they they, they seem to talk to each other, I'll go to one, and they, they then pass my name on to another, another. So you just I just go through different thing. Uh, I don't handle any money. Basically, at the end of the session, then I'll just give them the, uh, the address of UNICEF and they send the donation and checks directly to them. So I've got no idea how much they send. Uh, so that's happened about over about 35 years ish. Wow. You know, um, See, and a wellness expert at his best. So you come into our wellness event on Sunday? De yes, de definitely. In, in fact, funny enough, uh, for one session, for one uh, women's issue, I did a relaxation session with uh, I think about 40 or 50 women. We were just lying down to do a, a session. I think it's about 20, 25 minutes. And I didn't know a couple of days later on the local paper they had a write up. And so the. Uh, Philip Chan got 40 women lying down on the floor doing exactly what he wants. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so that, that happened. And then obviously, uh, for some reason, I'm not sure why I, I stopped that. I think there was other things going on. Uh, so I just didn't, ha didn't have time. Um, yeah. <laughs> I can understand that. So we're, we're going to be seeing you on Sunday, which is going to be absolutely brilliant. It's always good to, to catch up and see you and, you know, touch base with you because uh, you have a wealth of knowledge and, you know, you to give that over to people. As I said, you at the start, you are so humble in in the person that you are. You're absolutely amazing. I don't think you even realise how amazing you actually are. Look, you're going to make me cry and, and all well up and everything. So we're going to your mentoring because you've been mentoring for a long, long time. And you don't basically you mainly deal with high net worth clients, obviously, you know, when it comes down to your maths and you, you've got your financial planners and, you know, your will writing and all that all comes in and, and all your writing, your maths expert. I mean, what made you decide to go into mentoring? OK, they, they kind of um, one thing led to the, to the, the other and it's kind of uh, gel and because it's like nutrition. I, I was uh, coaching a lot of sports from uh, county national to international standard. And I, I then got involved in finding about nutrition. And then obviously then, then that was brought in the, in the training weekend courses. I then talk about nutrition as well as the, the other training methods. And that led to other stuff as well. And also when I actually was qualified uh, as an independent financial advisor and doing my, all my exams for my financials, you know, uh, I said, and... I got recruited by American Express. Uh, I was one of the 1010 planners and to look after the, the high net worth. And yeah, I, I was very good at looking at spots and gaps in the, in the, the financial laws at that time so I can help my clients to save, save money. Um, Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it, isn't it? It's, you know, doing the things that you're good at. And a lot of people say, you know, le learn the things that you're not good at. I mean, even I said that on a few occasions, you know, to try and use technology. But I know that it's going to help people in the future. So it's something that they've got to learn, really, because otherwise they're just going to get left behind in any type of business. But, you know, always, always work on the things that you're good at to make yourself absolutely brilliant at it. Because by doing that, you enjoy it, don't you? You see, one of the amazing things about the Women's Institute, you know, and I just support all the ladies because... You know, I think the, the philosophy is great, you know, that the, the women is take charge to, to learn things, to, to impact on their family and finance. We have never teach our children how to actually look after the money. They're, they're very good at spending the money, but we don't teach them the value of it. So yeah. uh, so when I have the opportunity to go to different uh, women's issues, provided they, they pick that topic, then I can share with them something 
uh, about the, the financial planning to how to uh, teach the young, young, young kids yeah. uh, or about nutrition, the basis of nutrition and, and, and things like this, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I remember like, like my kids are at school like now and it's very much they do business studies at school and they cover a lot of things. But I reckon really they should learn how to do tax returns. They should learn how to do VAT. They should learn how to, as you said, do the value of money. But also when it comes down to food, they do food technology and they'll come back with different foods. But it's like, you know, there's no nutritional value in it. They just they just make whatever is really easy for that particular time. And I, and I absolutely agree with what you're saying. Well, you see, the, the, you see the problem with some of the, the older guys because they have never been given the nutrition tool. That's why a lot of them, uh, men of my age and older, they, they suffer from the, uh, the furniture disease. You, you know okay. what that is, don't you? No. That's when the chest drops down to drawers. <laughs> the chest, chest drops the, down to where? That's, that's when the, the chest drops down to the drawers. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> that's, 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 that's because they overeat. When their belly drops down to the drawers. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no, I, I, I had contemplated becoming a stand, stand up comic once, but, but, uh, but my mum said, don't ever do that. People will laugh at you. you know? <laughs> this is how I've been trying to do different professions. I was still trying to find something I'm good at. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why I've been doing this, that, and the, and, and the other. To try and find something I'm actually can be good at, you know. Uh, maybe one day when I get to get to 200 years old, I might find something that I'll be good at. <laughs> <laughs> You're good at plenty of things, don't you worry about that, right? So we're going to go on to who's who now. If any of you that don't actually know what who's who means, it's it's a little code word with um with Philip because it's very much that 1999 to the year 2002, he was an international who's who professional for the field in education. Explain what that means in, in blunt terms there, uh, Philip. Well, uh, yes, I got nominated uh, every single year, every consecutive year from uh, 1999 to, actually it's not 2002, for about 10, 11 years. So it's oh, almost, 2012. It's, it's, uh, 12, yes, uh, 2012, that doesn't matter. I can't, I can't do maths. You can't do maths. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so that was some, someone not nominated me to become the top one professional in that area. So it's nothing that I, I knew anything about it except I keep getting nominated. So thank you for whoever they keep nominated for, for, for that one. That's absolutely lovely. Now, Child Genius, you, you did a promoting um, for contestants for Child Genius. What was that about? Well, Ch Channel 4 TV have this program called Child Genius. And obviously at that time they were looking for contestants. Uh, so they uh, can't remember who they got some of the researchers found me and said can I help them to promote them uh, in, in fact I want to show you this the, this was the, the you may not be able to see that these were the 20 finalists in the 2017 the charging wow. this program and this this young man here Trey Sean Ben Selmy he is my business partner now he was actually one of the 20 finalists of the 2017. Now, this young man is amazing. He was very, so shy, you know, and he has so much uh, lack of confidence, but he has done so well to, to overcome lots of things. And he's a, he's a speaker and he's an a author. Uh, uh, and in fact, we co-written this book together, The 10 Second Child Genius. Um, Stick the book up, that's it. Yeah, yeah. In fact, he, he was this just before Christmas... And he was uh, 12 years old, but when that went into publication, he was 13. This took us four days to write it from scratch. Wow, four days. Four days. And then also, yeah, we went number one uh, in less than 24 hours. And since then, Trey Sean has been work come to workshops with me. He's actually taken over for, from me. I can remember last year we went to, to Kent somewhere, and we did a session with about 50 kids. Trey Sean was just doing his coaching after about, I don't know, 10 minutes. There were kids doing a, a particular technique in under two seconds after five minutes coaching. Yeah. You know, so Trey Sean is amazing. You know, uh, he's running courses for, for people. He's inspiring kids who've got no confidence, lack of confidence. And he be actually come to speak at the um, Empowerment Weekend in, in February as well with his family. Yeah, the, the, yeah Trey, Trey is amazing. I mean, he came to the YYC event and he stood up on the stage. And, you know, all the Van Selmy family are all amazing. That The kids are out of this world and, and the, all the books that they've written. 
Um, and I've never seen a five year old get up on stage and give as good as he got because he, you know, that's his, his younger brother, which is in case anybody doesn't know. But, you know, he, he's a beautiful child inside and out, and he's such a handsome fella. Yes. And, um, also, my hat to, to uh, the, the mother Sabrina, and she's really the one that encouraging them. And you see, through the love of encouragement, you give the platform to your children to, to actually let the, the tan shine. And all five children have tans in different areas as well. You know, and and Sabrina is just amazing, and also the the grandma Mary Paul. They just are so supportive of their children and grandchildren. Then they have this platform now to excel and to inspire other children as well. Mm -hmm. And um, well, I I think I'm not going to say too much because they they be coming on on stage in February. So folks, you need to come and see them. They, these are amazing family. They the five is known as the Fantastic Five. We are indeed. So let's go on to your thing that everybody knows you about now. It's your 10 second maths expert. So how long have you been the, I know obviously we talked about you've been a teacher for nearly 50 years, but how long have you been the 10 second maths expert for? Probably over 40 years. Wow. Because we remember I said I wasn't good at anything and I did the research and some of the techniques, in fact, none of the techniques I do as original. And these techniques has been around for anything from 100 to 1,000 years old. And normally when I go to workshop, I say, you know, all oh, these, these, these techniques have been around for 1,000 years old. I am not 1,000 years old, you know. You look nothing like 1,000 years old. No, no. So, <laughs> so, so, so basically, I, I suppose I, I package it and make it a bit more fun. And it's, it's the presentation, uh, you know. And so once people have, a, uh, I'll share with them the technique and they practice it, they can actually do it in under 10 seconds. Hence the mass 10 second mass expert is because once I share with whoever it is, you know, uh, in fact, I could do a quick demonstration if, if you like. Ladies and gentlemen, we will give them a demonstration in, in a couple of minutes. We're gonna yeah. go through this first and then we're gonna do a demo with you. Yeah. Um, and at least then we can, uh, you know, can show everybody exactly how to do, you know, something in 10 seconds. So you've, you've run hundreds of mathematical workshops working with children and their parents. What made you decide to do that one? Well, it's always nice to, when the parents are learning with their child. It, it yeah. creates a bonding and, and also then it, it breaks. A lot of the attitude I find when kids at school say, I'm no good, it's coming from the parents. Mm. So I want to break that taboo, you know. Uh, and so I encourage parents to come with their, 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 their children. I typically, over the last 45 years, I do about 19 workshops a year. And depending where it is, I, it could range from anything from uh, 50 people to, to maybe about 600 people. So wow, that's a lot of it's, it's just great uh, to me, you know, it's just great for family working together. Because, again, mm -hmm. sometimes when you go to a thing, you know, the son or daughter may have forgotten something, then mum and dad have, uh, or, or even grandparents would come. And in fact, one granddad who came, uh, he got, his grandson got so frustrated, he said, stop it, granddad, you're showing me up. <laughs> <laughs> and I think he was about now eighty something, eighty two or something. Um, yeah. yeah. And he yeah. he left school at, at something like fourteen, getting no qualifications. But again, it just shows that sometimes if people are taught the wrong system or me method, or actually inappropriate, because if you're a left hander and someone gave you a right hand tool, you're not going to work very well. You see, some of the teachers like that sometimes one one size do not fit all. You know. Teachers got to be able to be flexible, but they need to have the training to recognize that in the classroom, you got different people with different learning style and how to integrate your, your, your lessons in such a way to bring them all in, you know. Yeah, uh, so it goes into my next thing as well, because you, you also mentor trainee teachers, don't you? Yes, yes, I've done that for a number of years. You know, uh, I would say up after my second school onward, I, I you know, which is actually... Quite shocking. When I first went to my first school in, in Norwich, it used, it's, it used to call Cossie Secondary School. The name has changed now. And when I, after three years, I decided to move on, my colleagues were shocked. They said, why are you moving on? Because, you know, I said, I'm actually going for a scale two, which is the next step. And apparently in that particular school, no one had gone from a scale one to scale two for at least after about 15 years. Okay. And I thought, why, why? You know, so I, and then, uh, so I, since I went to my second suit, then I kind of drift into coaching other, other staff as well. And because of some of the methods I've I, I been teaching, and people said, wow, how do you do that? You know, 
I also had my challenges. So I came close to uh, getting sacked twice from two different schools by introducing these three techniques. Oh, you really? Know. Is it because uh, you were showing everybody up? I'm not sure what, what, what the recent reason is, uh, but I came close to losing my job. So it frustrates me. Uh, in my early days teaching, well, I was not allowed to introduce these techniques. You know, mm. uh, for about, I knew them for some like 20 odd years before I was really, I, I then took the plunge and said, if I'm going to get sat, I'm going to get sat, but I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah. Which is great. And, and, and you, you know, I've got on here that something that you said that many of your students have gone to Oxford University, Cambridge, as you said before, got, uh, uh, got PhDs, first class honours degrees. There is so much that obviously you've put into the system. We need to clone you. So like when you're finished here, go straight down to the cloning station and we'll just put a few of you. All right. <laughs> no, no, I, I think no, it's the ability or, or, or I've done is you know, it's, I was trying to do what Mr. Duff did for me. Just give them a word of encouragement. I, I've done nothing but was just trying to encourage them. That, that's it. Because they have the, the ability is always here for them, you know. And you just need someone to say, yeah, come on, you can do it. You can do it. That, that's it. So that is all, all I've done. Just say, yeah, encourage them. But they have the ability. They have done the hard work for it. So I can't take any credibility for that because they are the people who put in the hard work. So well done on all, all of them, yeah. See, see, ladies and gentlemen, like I said, this gentleman is the most humblest person I've ever met. You know, nothing is to do with him. It's all down to them, even though he's his 10 seconds math expert. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to have a demo of um, of Philip doing maths. And I've got me I've got my phone. So I grabbed my calculator just just to make sure that we know he's going to be right. But just to, just to prove to you, ladies and gentlemen, that, that he is going to be right. So I'm going to get it all set up for you. You get your ring set up so you know exactly what you're doing. And I've got me, I've got me calculator. It's all sitting here waiting. Mm -hmm. All right, right. Max, all down you, to you. Can you give me a number, any number, say between fifty and ninety? Between sixty-four. 50, sorry, sixty-four. 64. All right, do on your calculator. Um, uh, sixty-four times sixty. Uh, sixty-four times sixty-six. Sixty-four times sixty-six. So I've I've done sixty-four yeah. times. So it 66. should be four two two four. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, give give me um a four digit number. Make the, make all the numbers different. Make 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 it don't make it a simple number. Make, make, so am I am I clearing this now? This yeah, one? clearing that. Clearing that now. Give me a, a okay. four digit number, please. Uh, five four. Five four three seven. Five four three seven. Now, can you times that number by um nine 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 four times it by four nines? Yeah. I've done that. Yeah, yeah. right. So um, the number you should have got is, is 54364563. It is as well. So if any of you can see that, I don't know if you can see that there. Yeah, 54. 3645563. Absolutely amazing. So now. <laughs> my my business partner Trey Sean, when he did, he did something similar with the kids there, we did the same exercise. He he did it with those kids, and those kids after five minutes were doing that in under two seconds. Wow! So this is my business partner Trey Sean. He was thirteen then, yeah. So yeah. Trey is he is now taking over the mantle for me, you know. And in fact, so, I've, I've, there's so many kids now who can actually do something similar or better than me. That's why you, my my students can never be as good as me, but they can be better than me. And the proof of the case is so many of my ex, ex pupils from the, the nine different schools I, I taught in the UK, they have gone on to do great things. Uh, Trey Sean became my, my pr apprentice um, a year ago. He's now have taken on. And sometimes when we have workshops together, literally I start for 10 minutes, he takes over the rest. You know, and I just okay. sit back and then I'll take the glory. I'll take the praise, you know, and he's doing all the work. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you don't. So so why did you when I when I pick 64, why did you times it by 66? Excellent. You see, if you look carefully, 64 times 66. First of all, I, yeah. I, I say, tell me the obvious that you notice about the, the question. What the sixty-four times sixty-six? Yeah, yeah. Well, 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 can, tell me one thing that's that's obvious to you. Uh, the six. The six, because they're in the, they're both numbers in the sixties. Yeah. They. Yeah. So you chose a number in the sixties, and I chose a number in the sixties. Yeah. 
if you add four and six together, what do you notice? If you add the four ten. and six together, it's ten. So therefore, yeah. when you uh, let's do a different one. Let's say if I say uh, seventy, let's say how you told me seventy three. Yep, so let's do seventy three. I would have chosen seventy seven. Why would you have chose seventy seven? Why well, not seventy one? Okay, so first of all, the, the seven and the seven are they in the seventies? Right. And if you add the three and seven together, it makes ten. Ten. So when you right. do, when when you do that, so and if you look at the first example, sixty four times sixty six. If you do, do the last two numbers, four times six is twenty four. Right. And to get the, the other two numbers, there's two ways you could do. You go six times six, which is thirty six. Yeah. Then add six, which is forty two. So that's forty two. Or you could go add one to that, that makes seven, six sevens are 42. So if I do this example here, 73 times 77, so if I say what is three sevens, three sevens are 21, my age. And then I could go seven times seven, then add seven, or I could say add one to the seven, make eights. So seven eights are 56, so the answer is in five, six, two, seven. So what I'm trying to get is, by learning to spot patterns, sometimes you can actually shortcut lots of the conventional ways of doing things because you just spot patterns. You but see, if I'd have done ninety-one, I would have added ninety-nine. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And and okay. when I did the bigger number, which I'm not going to get the secret away now, and until some some of you come to my workshop or, or trace your own workshop, I actually get a trace yeah. because he does it so much better than me. You know. Uh, so when we teach young children how to spot pattern. They will self-learn. In right, fact, okay. the young, you see, the critical age is actually from uh, zero to seven years old. 50% right. of the brain development happens in the first seven years. So the more stimulus you can give them at that age, you know, it could be music, languages, anything, and particularly in mathematics, to learn to spot patterns, young children will start to self-learn. You know, and this is the thing... That's that is why uh, I'm trying to so close. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. Robert, you can be my apprentice anytime. Yeah. So, so the key thing is, uh, it's not so much me. It's about encouraging uh, parents to say, just encourage your children. Yeah. Look for patterns. Look for shapes. Once you get that awareness, then the brain will start to develop in its own way. The, the critical age is from zero to seven. Think about it. From zero to three. How do we learn language? It's yeah. subconscious. It's yeah. subconscious. So, suppose, any, sorry, go on. No, anything that we say, the brain is learning. This is why it's so critical. What we say to children in the first seven years could actually destroy the confidence or actually could boost the confidence. So, it's, it's um, research showed by the age of 11, most kids have actually got a very deflated. Um, confidence because they've been so much negative is gone in their uh, everyday language by the, the parents the, uh, the the peers the teachers and, and media so by just paying attention to the what we're saying to children so it's encouraging not not say you stupid so and so how could you be so dumb you know you know the more encouraging we can be in those first seven years you find automatically you will give your children a, in you know a head start in every single way, because they will start learning, their, their mind will be, be searching for patterns. I, I just can't, you know, I, I get so excited, I sometimes I, I, I'm speechless, because when you do that, they will learn between 50,000 times quicker than normal, naturally. Yeah, yeah, that is why young children can speak, you know, two, three, four, five languages by the age of seven, give them the right stimulus. They're like and, a sponge, aren't they, at that age? Yeah, and you, the parents, you don't need to be good at maths. You just need to be encouraging. And yeah. that is the key thing. Yeah, I mean, I suppose this is the reason why it's very much that, oh, you're still talking. No, you're not talking on my end. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you literally, it, it just stopped on my end completely, so I started talking. I think we've got a bit of a delay going on. No, no, no. Yeah, so it, it's very much that... Um, with obviously what you're saying with there, I suppose it's like in the primary school, that's the reason why they teach fives, tens, twenties, thirties and twenty fives and all that, because it's like the fives at the end and the one, two, three, four, five and, and that one. I mean, I remember seeing a video you did with your with your granddaughter mm -hmm. where you were doing 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero, and then you would go in one, two, three, four, yeah. five, seven, eight, nine, zero. Yes, yeah, so, so in fact, that's a sort of, sort of point because um, I showed Chloe my, my system. I, I was trying to impress her, you know, and when the way I had done, done that, she said, wait a minute, there's a better way to do that. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I always tell people, so the obvious is not obvious and who's obvious. And I have missed it all these years. I've missed that pattern and she spotted it. You know, and so rather than do my way, she just reversed it. And my way you know, only goes so to 10 times. Her way goes indefinitely. But, oh, but wow. she, well, she stitched me up. She put that on the Facebook straight away, you know. And, and she said, um, you see, when I finished my ninth book, and in fact, this, this is my ninth book, I thought that, that, that was the last book I will ever write on maths. That took Quick, me put your three time. books up, uh, Philip, because you've got that one, which is 10 Seconds uh, Speed uh, Maths yeah, for Parents. Yeah. Speed, yeah. yeah and yeah, what's your next one? Right, this one, this is it's on limited uh, edition, so you can't get this on Amazon. Okay. Um, this Not too one, close. <laughs> this is the, the, the 10 second speed mass technique. Yeah. Um, this is the book I co written with Trey Sean. It's the 10 second child genius. Yeah. And your um, other one? This one is actually uh, for adults, fresh start learning for adults. And this is the one I dedicated to my three math teachers, particularly to Mr. Roland Duff. You know. Um, so, but ladies, so, yeah, ladies and so, gentlemen, so, have a look at these books. I've got 26 more books uh, I have actually a shelf at the moment. And she said, no. And I asked her, um, can I say, so if I do write my next book, can I put this in my next book? And she said, yeah, of course. But she's got to keep 90% of the profit. <laughs> she's good at maths. <laughs> well, the fact that she's put it on Facebook, it means I, I can't even, wouldn't chat of it. So there's no evidence. You know, so she was very, true and very smart. Well done, Chloe, maybe. <laughs> she done well. Obviously, it must be the grandpa that she's got, you know. She's very good at uh, sorting her maths out. So, But this this comes to the end of our um, our session there, Philip, because, you know, I know when we spoke, you know, only a few hours ago, you turned around and said to me, we're only going to be on for 10 minutes. But actually, we've been on nearly 90. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I've gone completely over again. And um, yeah, so we've gone through quite a lot of information. And now everybody gets to know about you because it's like, as I said to you before, you're you're a very humble man. You don't let a lot of people in. You just go, you wash over it all and go, yeah, I just do this. I just do that. And you're absolutely amazing. And for what you've achieved through your life, has been brilliant. What you do for charity and what you've done in your life is amazing. And you're so giving in every way. I think it's absolutely beautiful. You're a beautiful person inside and out. And I want to say thank you for coming on. And um, I will be seeing you on Sunday. I'll also be seeing you on the 5th of February. I'll also be seeing you at 529 Club at Pinewood, if you're going to be there on the, I don't know, the 7th of yeah, February. The, the, that's, that's the 5th of yeah. February. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we'll be there on there as well. So I want to say thank you very much for joining me. It's been absolutely amazing. I think you're brilliant in every way. Well, thank um, you. No, you're more than welcome. You deserve every bit of it. Um, now, ladies and gentlemen, what I want to say to you, this is Mr. Philip Chan. He is the, the absolute brilliant 10-second maths expert. Um, he's got his book out. So if you want to go to Amazon to go and get that, you can uh, go and get that and, well, just, just be absolutely amazing. And not only does it help you out to, to learn the maths that you might have forgotten in your time, but it also helps your kids out as well. Because I don't know if you're anything like me. My children come home from school. My children are like 12 and, and 16 now. But... You know, they come home from school and say, Mum, I need help with my maths, ex my maths work. And I look at it and I go, you've got no chance. <laughs> you know, because it is very much, it's gone on from, from my day, back in the day before the war kind of thing. Um, and it's very much that it's moved on so much that I, I look at it sometimes and think, you've got no chance of me understanding what that means. Uh, and it's, it's so hard. So I'm hoping that your book will, will help parents out like that. So thank you very much for that, Philip. You're absolutely amazing. Thank you so much again, and uh, really, it's been a real pleasure, uh, you know, for you to, to, to be on your show and also to share a little bit. And I hope it helps some of the parents as well. I'm sure it will. And then for some of the bits that you've put on there is brilliant. Now, what I want to say to you, is, ladies and gentlemen, it's come to that time. That I'm going to tell you about very quickly the empowerment weekend that we've got coming up in February the 2nd and 3rd. It's going to be an absolutely amazing event. We've got over 45 speakers. 
They're coming from all over the world to come and see you, to give you as much information they possibly can. You've got people that come in talking to you about branding, come and talk about publishing their books. It could be about marketing, or it could be literally just to get inside your brain to change your mindset. There are so many different things there for you to come and see. We've got stalls there. We've got people that you can network with. You can come and meet the VIPs. And you've got everyone from Greg Walker to Douglas Vermeer and to Alfie Best, right through to Tony J. Salimi, uh, Harry Sardinas. You've got so many different people. You've got um, Bradley Chapman heading it up. Um, he's, he's hosting it. And you've got co-host of um, Alfie Best, who brings in half a million, half a billion pounds uh, business he's got going on. So would you like to learn from him? I know I would. Um, even getting like 10% of that would be amazing. But um, yeah, so it comes to the Empowerment Weekend. All you've got to do is go to yes, you can inspire to achieve dot London. I'm actually going to put that on the comments. So at least then you've got that. If you do actually want to come to, to the event, that would be amazing. The tickets are available now. At the moment, they are on half price. I'm just sticking it in the comments there, ladies and gents. So you've got that. Um, the tickets are available now. Um, they're half price. So they start from like 20 odd pounds. So, you know, for a whole weekend of Saturday and Sunday for like 12 hours a day, you're pay basically paying less than a pound for a speaker for, for an hour. I mean, that's that's less than minimum wage. So, you know, for what, for what you're getting there, you know, you get so many different speakers. So I've put the tickets on there as well. So all you've got to do is click the link, which I'm going to put on here so you can see it. So right, I'm doing things while I'm speaking to you. Um, so I put that on there now. So you've got that. I can show you that. So that's the link that I've literally just put in in the uh, the comments box. So if you want to click that link or you do, you go through to that link. It puts you through to Eventbrite. And then basically with that, you can pick out what tickets you want. If you're not in the UK, don't panic if you can't get over. We have got streaming. It's £25 for both days, as in in total. Um, and then basically with that, you can stream it over the whole 12 hours per day and you've got access to that. So at least then you're not going to miss out on all the content. And, and you still get an absolutely amazing time. It just means you're taking two days holiday. <laughs> so I want to say thank you very much for joining. It's been absolutely amazing. Um, thank you, Philip. You've been absolutely amazing as well. And for everybody else that's come online today, it's been brilliant that you've joined in. You've, uh, you know, you've gone down there. Uh, Elizabeth said, wow, she's missed the broadcast, but she can do hashtag replay. That's absolutely fine. There's few people that have come in and said they'd love to watch it over again. So thank you very much for everybody. Our time is out. And we'll see you next week. I won't be here on Sunday because I'm going to be at the wellness event. So if you want to come to that at Rajan's event, I will be there on the 13th of um, Sunday, the 13th of January. And it's at King's College. Just get your tickets going to www.yycwellness.com. All right, darlings, take care. And I'll speak to you all very soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, then.